Oops, I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about Canada and some records that we find there. And this is a very, actually, it's, it's quite interesting. And it's not unusual that you will have, if you live in the United States, that you would have uh, relatives in Canada. It's also not unusual if you were uh, living in other parts of the world, you may also have relatives in Canada because of the lot of immigration that's occurred uh, from all sorts of places. Some of their, some areas of Canada have uh, major Chinese uh, residents and there are other parts of the country where uh, a lot of people from Scotland and Ireland and uh, uh, a lot of the other European countries, uh, Scandinavian countries, have settled. Uh, and we're going to explore that. This is part of a, and it's not real, not a real series of such, but it's part of a, a number of presentations I've been doing over the past couple of months uh, on specific, specific countries uh, and their record sets, their basic record sets, and how a little bit about their history and background. So that's what we're doing here with Canada and we'll get right into it. And uh, European involvement in Canada starts around 1000 AD with the Vikings. Um, when I was a lot younger than I am now, uh, it was quite controversial to, uh, to maintain that uh, anybody from Scandinavia had, uh, had visited the North American continent. There were there were a lot of the historians were uh, were not were very skeptical of that. Uh, now it's no longer after you know maybe fifty or sixty years later here we are, and uh, now it's not even an issue. Of course there were Vikings who came to America, and of course you'll find uh, artifacts that date from uh, back in the early, just after one thousand A.D. in that in that time period. Um, it was uh, basically uh, an appreciation of the of the technology that these people had and how much uh, how more advanced than they were always thought to be um, in most uh, historians lines. And I think a lot of people think that uh, uh, in history and when you go back into history and it's particularly when you get back into prehistory, you have the caveman syndrome. You think everybody lived in caves and everybody was uh, uh, technologically challenged and nobody had anything and even wheels were an innovation well not really the uh, vikings were able to to sail all the way around uh, the coast of europe and also down around africa and they they were managing to trade and and when they didn't trade they conquered and, and uh, so this is uh, part of where they landed in the on the very extreme east coast of, of canada um, the exploration of this area continued. Uh, there was uh, the first real uh, explorer was Giovanni Cabotto, or as you might have heard about him, John Cabot in 1497. Um, you realize that that date is significant uh, because that's the date that just one year after supposedly the uh, the current continent was discovered. I think if, if more discovery, if more history was done, uh, it would probably find that uh, uh, maybe Columbus wasn't first. Maybe uh, maybe there were other people like the Vikings who long long ago, and that it was pretty well known in Europe that there was a big continent or at least a lot of land over across that part of the ocean. And then, of course, the main person was the main two other explorers were French, Jacques Cartier and Samuel de Champlain. And they, um, they're, they were basically during the 1500s was the great exploration effort and then into the 1600s. Champlain actually came to settle the country. So they, that was when they, the change came. He established a French colony at Quebec City in 1608. Now, what's significant about 1608, uh, if, if you know a little bit about the history of the uh, United States and the colonies and the British colonies, you know that this is just shortly after the British landed in, in Jamestown 
and uh, quite a few years, uh, 12 years before the uh, pilgrims arrived in uh, Massachusetts Bay. So uh, French settlements in America are uh, at least as ancient or as, as go back at least as far as any of the British or English settlements in the Americas. Of course, both the French and the English were predated by a number of years, by over a hundred years, uh, by the Spanish, who had well established a huge um, st uh, uh, Spanish presence in the New World. Okay, they call it new because they were what they thought was old and they got here and now we know they're just about the same age if maybe older. And so the new world is not really a very good way to call it. Uh, just for, for information's sake, uh, the reason why we would mention some of these is, is easy. Uh, go back just a second here to the uh, previous one. There are no European records in Canada before 1608. Okay, that's, that's why the history becomes part of what we need to know about genealogy. Uh, if we're going to do uh, to our ancestors, we don't just automatically add another 20 years and go back and add another 20 years and get them back into the 1500s in America, because it wasn't uh, that wasn't the way that happened. Okay, so the other important thing is that we have the Hudson Bay with the company, which was formed in 1670. Uh, the reason why this is important is because because England. Great Britain and the and the and their empire was expanding expanding their empire rather aggressively during this period of time. Uh, the Hudson Bay became a significant factor because the Hudson Bay Company uh, gave Britain the uh, the foothold they needed on the North American continent. You can see all those red marks on the maps; those were all the trading posts they established from the Hudson Bay Company. So this is a uh, you can see it was a, a major. Uh, event in the history of, of North America that uh, all of these different places became uh, established as forts or trading posts in uh, in the uh, in up here in the northern part of the of, the, of Canada. And eventually, because of the presence and because uh, the uh, basically the uh, English were more. Uh, aggressive than the French on this in this area, and there was a constant conflict between uh, between the French and the uh, and the British colonists. But France uh, basically gave up in 1763 and ceded to Britain. So what was called New France at the time uh, became part of the British Empire. Now jumping ahead. Uh, you know, the reason why, okay, so the reason why that particular date was important was because uh, there are some records that, that uh, date back to that point in time. So these dates in the history are all significant to genealogical, to genealogical research because these are the time periods at which certain types of records were, be were beginning to be kept in the country. And I'll go through that uh, in just a few minutes here. And what we have here is the Constitution Act of 1867. Uh, the important thing here is that not, uh, not all the English colonies, not all the British colonies decided to have uh, uh, independence and decided that fight a war of independence. Uh, most of the others stayed in, stayed in the empire, which uh, then kind of uh, changed over to become the Commonwealth. So this is the, the Canada is one of the 15 Commonwealth countries. If you look around the map, you'll recognize, I'm sure, uh, some of the names. Uh, you may not be familiar with the fact that uh, uh, the, there were countries in, uh, in Africa and that India and other places like that. Um, even though your ancestors may have come from England or from Scotland or from Wales, it's not, a, it's not unusual for people to have uh, English ancestors who in fact lived their lives in some of these other countries, uh, including uh, the colonies in the United, the former colonies in the United States, and also 
in uh, these other places around the world. And so we have, uh, for example, I have uh, two of three of my ancestral lines go back to Australia. And uh, ultimately, these, these were people who emigrated from uh, England and went to Australia. They were not um, transported. They were, in fact, uh, paid to go there uh, because of a, an agreement was made. The situation there that created that was interesting because their parishes in uh, England basically did not want to establish poor houses. They didn't want to to have the poor people have to support the poor poor people indefinitely in their parishes. So they uh, the government came up with a plan where they could ship these people off to Australia, and so they were semi transported because they really didn't have any any um, uh, say about it. If they wanted to go, they went. And uh, I suppose if they asked to go, they were transported. They weren't sure what they would do when they got to Australia, but they got a much better deal by going to Australia than they would have had had they stayed in England. And in addition to that, the, um, uh, the benefit of that to the people was that they, uh, they, they became much more their descendants are much more influential in, in the country of Australia than they would have been in, uh, in England. So there's lots of places like that around the world and, and Canada is one place that has maintained a, um, a continual relationship with, uh, with Great Britain. Uh, Canada's government is parliamentary uh, it's a parliamentary representative government, and it has a written constitution, the Crown, the Senate, and the House of Commons. So they recognize the British Crown as part of their, of their legal system. However, the, the uh, voice of the Crown, the, the influence is, is, has been and continues to be very much attenuated. It's, very, it's been lessened over the years. And uh, well, one of the very important things uh, to, is to uh, recognize that uh, Canada is divided into provinces. Uh, and the, the provinces uh, are vastly different in their uh, population. Uh, the provinces, for example, uh, the new province, a, a province up there, which some of you may not have realized or recognized on before, uh, none of it was um, is very sparsely populated and uh, almost uh, entirely uh, a Native American um, people, and they're called <clears throat> in. Um, I won't remember that in just a second. It went out just as I tried to say it. Uh, the other sparsely populated areas are the, all of the northern Northwest, obviously, because there is a very short season where there's not just snow and ice. And so uh, maybe with global warming, this will become the, uh, uh, the Florida of the future because people want to go up there with all that beautiful beaches and all those, uh, all those, all that ocean up there. Um, anyway, what we have, we need to be aware of that. And as we get into the uh, into understanding more about the, uh, uh, the way that the records are kept and the way that this, for instance, more specifically, the census records were kept, that, that understanding the provinces is very important uh, to, to knowing what would happen here. So also what's important to understand, and this, this thing is gonna show you in a, a flipping through, showing you the English speaking, the French speaking, and uh, population by other languages, and then back to English. So you've got kind of a graphic going here that shows you the, the different languages and where those languages are spoken. About 56% of the country is English and 21.4% is French. Uh, unlike the United States, where uh, the percentages are getting close to being that way with English and Spanish, um, 
French and English are both the official languages of, of Canada. And those, if you have ever had a, the opportunity to travel there, you know that because all of the street signs and all of the, uh, the other signs uh, are in both English and French. So uh, you may end up, uh, depending on which part of the country your, your family came from, you may end up doing research in French as well as English. Uh, and perhaps in both languages. Religion is an important thing in, in Canada. <clears throat> and for our genealogists, one of the things that I'm, uh, that I'm usually uh, tells me a little bit about uh, how much uh, research has been done is to ask somebody about their ancestors and say, what religion were they? And it's, uh, it's usually I can tell pretty quickly uh, where I need to start helping and, and people. This is kind of a, a, a way to establish uh, where, what level of uh, research needs to be done for on a particular family line. If the person knows the religion of all of the family going back, then it's obvious they've done some research, uh, but that's, that's, not very that's not very usual. Now, interestingly enough, there are uh, a, quite a, a, a variety of religions. Uh, and unlike England, Roman Catholicism outnumbers the Protestants because of the French. So we have the French plus the remaining other people in the English speaking area and the other countries who have come there for uh, because of Catholicism. They're of Catholic religion, and then you have quite a bit of, of uh, Protestants, different Protestants. And in this particular case, they, uh, they have split out Anglicanism, which is the Church of England. And it's interesting to see how small a percentage of the people actually currently are of the Church of England. So you, you need to look at a variety uh, when you're doing genealogical records, you need to look at a variety of different religious backgrounds and knowing the religion of your ancestors and, and identifying what church they went to uh, is, is extremely important in, in locating a certain, uh, certain records. Okay, so the other part of, uh, of when we're talking about the three things that are most important about uh, learning about genealogical research is that the first and most important thing is like location. Uh, knowing the location of an event in your ancestor's life is crucial to uh, beginning the research because all, uh, almost all, there's, and that's not even, that's an understatement of anything, but nearly all, uh, genealogically uh, significant records are arranged and cataloged geographically. So knowing the name of the place, uh, the data and, and establishing the location on the face of the earth is extremely important for identifying what records could have been created at the, at the time that your ancestors lived in that location. So the first step, of moving backward in time in genealogy is not looking at the people's names, which is a trap, uh, but is looking at the places where the people are. If the places are consistent, then uh, and then you have you are able to assume that even so, somebody may have the same name that this person who lives over here is not the same as this person that lives over here, and the distance uh, that that of the separation is, is uh, crucial also because it decreases as you go back in time. What does that mean? It means that as you look backwards in the history of any of the countries, as, they, as you go back in, in, back in time, the technology obviously becomes less advanced if you wanna look at it from the fact that what we have today is advanced as opposed to what they had before. Um, that could be a long and long discussion right in itself, but let's suppose that we assume that our list is more complex and it is more complex. And what happens is that as we go back, 
you get less and less transportation options. And before 1830, which is the uh, sort of the ballpark beginning of the industrial revolution, uh, the, only, the only travel options that were available primarily were boats, ships, those kinds of things, things that were driven by the wind or pulled by on canals and um, horse-drawn and animal-drawn conveyances and walking. That was it, folks. So the, the distance that people lived from each other was very circumspect. There was a very large uh, database search that used uh, millions and millions of names uh, done by uh, my heritage. And they uh, calculated uh, the because from all of those data, uh, huge database review, um, the exact uh, distance between the places named uh, in the databases uh, for all of the different birth, marriage, and death. And what they determined was that before 1830, uh, the average distance for a person who was, who was born was that they got married and died within six miles of their birthplace. Now, six to 10 miles is my ballpark. And uh, that extends actually up until the 1880s. And uh, surprisingly, that, that number is not, uh, does not change as you get into uh, the high technology significantly. It, it raises only to about 15 miles when you get up into uh, the 20th century. And uh, interestingly enough, my wife and I uh, were born uh, in the same hospital. And so sometimes uh, that, of course, helps to, uh, to skew the, the statistics about where people are born. And uh, of course, we will probably be buried in the same cemetery. So there's a kind of a consistency there, even though we've lived in places all around the United States. Okay, so we've got to to understand, and this is a, a, the Canadian Geographical Name Database, and you can go on this. It's a Government of Canada uh, website. Uh, now, if you're wondering if you're going to take down all these places really quickly while I click through these, uh, these slides, what we hope to do is uh, upload a copy of this whole, uh, the slides of this as part of what you would call the handout. And it will be on the BYU Family History Library website in our archive section. You can go to the classes archive section and, uh, and then you will find a, a link to the, to the handouts here, which will be these slides. So you don't need to really worry about copying down all this. But in my case, I don't, I don't try to copy down the, uh, the URL, the, the address anyway. I generally just remember or have a list in my head or on, on my checklist of whatever of the, of the website. So knowing that there is a geographical database for me is what's important. Um, going on here. So once you, you, you start, and that's the beginning, is to identify the location. When you say identify the location, you mean, I mean, really where it was, not at Canada. That isn't the location, that's uh, the continent, a subcontinent, part of the continent. It's not, uh, doesn't help you to know your, your ancestor was born in Canada to find records. You might find some records by searching national Canadian records, but likely what's going to happen is you're going to find that your ancestor did not have a, a name that was unusual enough for you to make a determination as to which of all the people with that name or similar name uh, were, were uh, uh, was the, your person, your ancestor. Oh, remember, these people came from France, they came from England, and they came from other European countries. And you have the same problems in all of those European countries and Scandinavia and all of that because of the, the similarity of names. So we focus on the location. And once we know the exact location, then that will considerably uh, limit the number of options of people who may have had the same name at the same time in the same location. Not impossible, but less likely than when you're searching generally. And it's important if you've done any research in the United Kingdom, 
uh, to know that Canadian records are very similar. They have all the very same similar records. They're different categories, obviously in different places, and they're they're differently maintained, uh, but they are uh, they're very similar record sets as those in uh, all of the United Kingdom and the British Commonwealth. I would suggest to start with the government of Canada's Library and Archives, called Library and Archives Canada. And they have a section right here on their Canadian website of genealogy and family history. And they have uh, how, to, how to begin, how to get the strategy, and what kinds of records and how to access those records. And here is a, uh, a very good way to get into the records. Now, what you may be surprised if you're used to working with websites like Family Search, uh, Find My Past, uh, My Heritage, Ancestry. Yes, all of those countries, all of those big websites have Canadian records. Um, and um, three of those four are subscription-based websites. Uh, granted that if, if you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with a partnership with Family Search, you can get free access to Find My Path, Ancestry, and My Heritage, and other even French websites. And so basically, those that is a way. But it's understanding this is a free website, and you can go here and do the research here. And it's very much um, it's very important to do that with a number of different websites because many of the websites have different ways of indexing and different ways of searching. Uh, they're called their search engines are different. And so you may not find it in the other websites and you may find it on this website or vice versa. You, you may do a lot of searching here in the archives and not find your people and then go to family search or, or ancestry and find them. So I would understand that this is another tool, but it's important to understand that when you're doing Canadian research, you have this important and very important tool. So there's free access to all these millions of records out there. These are the major record collections of, of, from, um, from Canada. Now, uh, sometimes when I have a list like this, I go through it with a little bullet list and go click, 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 and try to bring them out. But I think that gets to be somewhat confusing. Uh, knowing that they're the M, uh, the BMD records or birth, marriage, and death records, we also call them vital records. They have a tendency to call them BMD records in uh, the British Empire, and then census records, military records. Now, what what do all these records have in common? All of these records have one important thing in common: they have a beginning date. They have the original, the oldest date at which those records would or could be possibly be available. Now, what did we do at the beginning? What did I do at the beginning of this presentation? I went through some history. The history said this is when, when uh, Champlain founded the first uh, settlement. This is when they did the certain thing. Well, those kinds of things that happened were what affected the fact that records were being generated or kept. And so those were cutoff dates. Before that, you're going to have to assume that every one of the people that you have here that was European speaking or any other country around the world were, um, were, not, um, were not here. And so they just didn't get, uh, there was no records. And that's really hard for people to get to conceptualize. I, I really, uh, very, very frequently, the question I have is, I cannot find a birth or marriage or death or whatever, fill in the blank, uh, record for my ancestor in, in 1744 and, uh, and whatever. And that's they're asking that, unknowing that no records were kept in any of those three categories in the location they're looking for uh, before that date. So every time you look at a list of records that may be available, then you, then you need to understand that these records are um, uh, basically limited, time limited, 
and that you need to make sure you understand the time limitations on each of the categories of records that are here. You also understand that land and property records, for example, began with the point of initial European contra contact and proceed across the countries in, uh, in, a, in a fashion, sometimes from both ends of the continent, as they did in the United States and or from the South. So we have, uh, we have a, a, an important thing. And another important date to, re to recall is when the United States began complaining, uh, began uh, claiming sovereignty over the land east uh, west of the uh, Mississippi River and north. And so they had to come to an agreement between the United States government and Canada as to the, uh, the, the border between the two countries, which by the way, is still going on and to some extent. So that, that's um, an ongoing thing. So you need to investigate uh, all of those dates and the times that those occurred. Um, immigration and citizenship records, uh, this, is in, this is something interesting because uh, what would happen is that people will call, uh, come to me and they'll say, well, where did your ancestors come from? And they'll, and, and, and they'll say, well, I'm, I'm doing research in Canada. I don't know where my ancestors, I need to know how my ancestors arrived and how they immigrated into the country and how they arrived. Well, where did they come from? Well, they came from Scotland. Well, um, Scotland was part of the British Empire. And by the way, when they moved from Scotland to Canada, they were moving across the country. They weren't moving into a different country. It was the same country. Um, and there are no immigration records because they didn't immigrate. And there's no naturalization records because they were already citizens. Oh, so that whole category evaporates unless your people came from Scandinavia like my did and landed in, um, in um, New Brunswick. So basically, um, that's when you start to see, you need to know more about your people and their roots and where they came from. Uh, as it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. What came first? Do you have to find the records first or do you have to know the information? And sometimes if you're doing a search, they'll ask you to fill in all the information to do the search. And you'll say, well, if I knew all that information, why would I be doing a search? And, but it's, uh, it, it's basically the whole process of learning how to do research is learning how to guess your way, I would say, guess your way into finding out which records apply. A land and property records are extremely important. And uh, one of the reasons they were important is that in many cases, when the immigrants came to Canada, they were, uh, there were land grants, just like they were in the United States. Uh, we had what was called homesteading, and they had a similar land grant type of property thing in, in Canada. So you can, you can track your and find out a, a significant amount of records of information about people arriving in Canada through the land and property records. Directories are always helpful. Uh, we don't often think, uh, today I think this is gonna be one of the things as time goes on, that it's going to be less and less obvious to people that directories are important. They'll just say, well, we look it up on the internet. Well when those of us who lived in the in the uh, BC before computers, uh, directories were uh, the way that we had to learn uh, where we had to find people. And uh, directories go back into the 1600s in Europe and across. And so there are very early directories of many of these places, biographies, North, the Northwest Mounted Police personnel records. This is something. These are all the major records collections that are on the in the archives, and railroad employees, which are very important, and post offices and postmasters. So there's a lot of records here that are available directly. Now, some of these records, even maybe most of these records, may be available on the bigger websites like um, Ancestry and and uh, Family Search and Find My Past but I'm just giving you an alternative. Now, <clears throat> this is important because this gives you kind of a uh, thumbnail of not only where the records are located, uh, not only when the records were created, but gives you how the 
population moved across and became uh, significant in different parts of, of, the, of the country. So for example, uh, if you choose a, um, uh, a, country, a place in the United States, and I'm gonna use that in as an example, um, unless you are from someplace else, it'll be the same, it'll be the same kind of, of issue. But for example, if I were to say here in Utah, we're here in Brigham in Provo, Utah, uh, what's the earliest records we would find in, of, of people who lived in uh, Provo, Utah it would be fairly simple because all you'd have to do is go look and see when the first settlers came into Provo, Utah in about 1849. And you would find out that Utah Valley only went back that far. And there would be no records for anyone in living in Provo, Utah you'd have to go someplace else. And even if you went up to Salt, to, uh, to the Salt Lake County, just north of us from Utah Valley, Utah County, you would be at 1847. And so after, before 1847, you simply would not have any records to speak of of any Europeans, at least no genealogically significant records of any Europeans in, in what we now call Utah. So this is the same thing in Canada. You need to know when each of these uh, provinces were created because that, was only, that only happened as they got a population which was significant. So as you look at the census years here, 1825, that's called Lower Canada. Now that may stop you, but you understand that the provinces did not exist as they exist today. And this was the area of the um, prom uh, primarily uh, uh, Ontario and Quebec, and so those are that's the area. And when you talk about Canada East, that adds New Brunswick and and all of the other islands, and then Canada West begins the process of moving west of of uh, uh, Ontario province, and then as that moves through, you get to Manitoba, and then you have a different census for Ontario, more censuses, and every ten years. Now, if you're familiar with English uh, uh, research, you'll recognize those numbers right off the bat because they are the 10-year census, 1851, 1861, 1871, 1881, 1901, 1901, okay? And the census of Canada in 1921 and the census of the Prairie Provinces in 1926. Now, for privacy reasons, the later censuses have not been published and are not available yet. Uh, by the way, the English census uh, for 1921 is becoming available in, uh, in 2022. And so that, uh, and by the way, family, Find My Past has the contract for indexing and publishing the uh, British census. I'm sure the other companies will, uh, will find a way to get that uh, on their websites, but initially uh, it will be on Find My Past. Okay, so this is the census rolls, and uh, if you were if you're if you're looking for a way to get into the records, then you can find that. Now, all of these census records are searchable on most of the big uh, most of the large websites. Uh, you need to check to see which if they're missing any censuses, but if you need to, you can go to the uh, the Canadian archives, as I've already mentioned. Now. <clears throat> This is where it starts to get complicated because basically immigration and citizenship, as I mentioned, uh, if they came from, um, from England, from the British Isles, and they were citizens of, of the British Isles, then they, uh, they just came to Canada. Uh, there was no, it was like coming into the United States before the 1880s. Uh, there, were, there's no, there was no real restriction um, but they still had to register and they still became part of the system and the country. It's like if you move across the United States, we say, well, you, you know, you're free to move. I can move, uh, you know, if, if we decided, my wife and I decided to move to uh, uh, whatever state, we went to uh, uh, Maryland for a year to digitize records at the Maryland State Archives for Family Search as uh, missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And uh, we basically moved there and lived there for a year. Okay. What did we have to do? Oh, yes, it became very complicated. 
we needed to create a whole bunch of records, some of which are still haunting us after being home back three years. But uh, that's the same thing that happened, even though the people did not go through a formal uh, uh, naturalization process or no entry was required. They still had to um, they still had to register in all sorts of ways as they came into the country. Back there, we had to uh, get insurance. We had to get our address changed. We had to do a lot of different things that I, we would, we didn't necessarily would create records out there. The same thing happens with anyone coming into Canada. There will be records that are created as they come into the country. So you can see here where um, the records and, and citizenship type things are kept. Um, and I mentioned initially that there was a significant uh, Chinese uh, rep, uh, population in Canada, and particularly around uh, the West Coast in, uh, in Vancouver and in uh, out of, out of, uh, Vancouver and Victoria. So that's a uh, there's quite a significant number of Chinese. So this is a, another list of the types of records that you would be able to look for and the types of records that would be uh, available on uh, that you need to search for. Now, what do you do when you find a list of records like this? And let's say you want to look at the Canadian naturalization records 1915 to 1951. It's nice that I've listed them here, but what do I do with that? What do you do with that? What you do with that is you use Google search and you go to, to kit and you put in Canadian naturalization records and you put 1915 to 1951 and it will give you the websites that have those records like Family Search or Ancestry or whatever. Or Magic, huh? Okay, so that's how you can get there. And if they are available on the, from the Canadian archives, then it will tell you that in a search. So this is kind of the thing that's important, but you may also need to go directly to those major websites and others that uh, and look for these these classes of records. <clears throat> so, point: people who came to Canada from the United Kingdom and Ireland before before Ireland's independence were not immigrants. Okay. So. Interestingly, because uh, not so much here, but in Canada, they do have, and England, they do have specific parts of their website that are dedicated to genealogy and family history. So this is an important thing. We've got genealogy and family history, and we have um, uh, a very, very good example of introductory to it. This is a separate one. This is a different website than the, the library and archives website. They actually have a separate genealogy and family history website. So this is a good way. And now we have another archives uh, of Canada website, and this is a different website. Uh, this one has more uh, historical records, not, and they're all, they're all very helpful. You might have photographs, digital objects, um, all sorts of things in here that are different. Um, you just have to go out here and explore this and look for uh, this. In addition, hate not wanting to be um, any way of uh, discouraging anyone when they get into Canadian research, but there are, this Archives of Canada website actually incorporates information in over 800 local websites, archive websites. So there are over 800 local websites that contain archival information. So even this makes the National Archives look rather not very difficult to get into, but uh, a lot of this has is, is been digitized and a lot of it's there and it be, behoove anyone who's interested in doing research in Canada to explore those. And I've not, and I've mentioned this, but I'll emphasize it now that there are many records in the large online databases. The Family Tree website 
include um, family search, ancestry, and find my past. Um, also my heritage, but I, uh, there are not enough, well, there are some records on my heritage, but uh, so far they have not really had a lot. Their emphasis is more in European records. You're more likely to find records on the continent from in, uh, in, in Scandinavia in, uh, in my heritage. Of course, I have to mention the Family History Guide, the fhguide.com. The Family History Guide is a free website. It's the educational partner of Family Search, and it has um, a country section, and in each of the of, of, a, a, a section for each of the company, countries of the world that have major genealogical record sets. And uh, they take you step by step through all of the different types of records. Now, if you really want to start someplace that is uh, that makes it uh, organized and simple and step by step, you go to the Family History Guide and go to Canada and start learning your work, working your way through the records and the handouts and the the videos that are here, so that eventually what you get is uh, is an overview of all the different records and how to find them, and you have little things up here called quick links. And uh, little quick link things will take you directly to the records for those record sets on uh, some of the larger websites. So this is a, a way to get to it. Another useful tool, uh, once again, a lot of these things are, are educational as well as uh, research aids in a sense. And the Family Search Research Wiki has uh, uh, connections and explanations about uh, records all, all over the world and of course with Canada and you can see on the right hand side there's a list of uh, record types and you can go there and learn about all of these types of records and then there will be links out to some of the record sets obviously uh, even the family search research wiki cannot be exhaustive and you may find more records on other websites, such as the ones that I've looked at, like the archives website. Um, there's also, excuse me, a significant amount of records on, excuse me, a significant number of records listed on the Canada website of the Family Search website. So you go to familysearch.org you go to the historical record collections and then there's a map of the world and you click on areas like Canada and then it will take you directly to the country or a list of countries and you can go directly to a country. What they have here are the list of the records that are sets that are available in, for Canada in a list. And if you go down and scroll down, you'll find a huge long list. And just to mention that there are three kinds of records available on of family search. The first records appear here in the, in the historical record collections and, the, uh, and they're indexed records primarily. There's a few that are still being indexed, but there's uh, a significant number of their indexed records are in the historical record collections. That means you can search by the name of the people as well as places and things like that. That's the index part of it. However, there's uh, more than half of the records on the Family Search website are unindexed. And those records primarily show up in the catalog. So you go up there at the top where it says records, images, family tree, genealogies, catalog. You click on the catalog and uh, it will take you to the records organized geographically around the world. So there you check with records. Those records will need to be searched page by page, unless you're lucky enough to have a record with an index already that somebody created at the time the record was created. And then there, they may not know, but there is a third set of records on Family Search, which is tremendously uh, useful uh, in its way. And it's the second object of their images, and it's images only. Uh, and, well, fortunately, Family Search is involved in a huge digitization project worldwide. Unfortunately, uh, they're way ahead of the indexing and uh, considerably ahead of getting anything into the catalog. 
So they had a, they created a third category of place called the images, and where they essentially pile in all of the images that are being created. And that that changes every week, and nearly every day, as new records come in from all of the people doing digitization around the world, which, by the way, is continuing, even though we have a pandemic. And so when you go to images, you have to look geographically, because that's the only way you'll find the records. But that, you need to know, are all the newer records, and you then will have to search by date, and then you have, can get into the record images yourself and then go through them page by page if necessary. But you have to look at all three places or you can't really say that you had any, that you made an attempt to find the records. When people say, well, it didn't come up when I searched for it, the answer is yeah, and you only searched for less than, less than, way less than half, probably only about a third of the actual number of records on the website. Okay. And then if you go to Ancestry, you go to the card catalog, which is under the search menu. And then you put in Canada, and then it'll give you by category of records and show you all of the records that are sets that are there on Ancestry. So it's helpful to go to these large websites and check to see if they have the records before you start looking for uh, doing searches and, and getting frustrated. Okay, well, that takes us through what we have uh, to talk about today in Canada. I just kind of summarize a couple of things. First thing I would summarize is uh, you need to get uh, familiar with the history, just the general outline of the history. Go online, watch a few videos on YouTube or whatever about Canadian history and learn about how it was settled and when and where. And then you need to understand more about the people that you're looking for. The, the key to finding anybody, any place, is to identify a specific location. I mean, down to the house. I mean, down to the plot of ground that they lived on, of where an event occurred in your ancestor's life. Using that and a time frame, you can then begin looking for records. And then you search by names and by other information, dates and names. And that will get you into the record sets, particularly those in any country, but uh, obviously here in Canada also.